What do we have here, Ken? Let's see. Oh, it's a, an indictment. All right. Why don't you read it to me? Mr. You're Bonnie. up for election, aren't you? Mr. Mr. Bonnie. You got it, didn't you? Mr. Bonnie. You told me that you told him that you were going to get me. He said he was going to get me. Okay, you've got the indictment. It's all you're going to get. Let's read it. Let's go. Theodore Robert Bundy, you are charged, indictment, two counts burglary, two counts murder in the first degree, three counts attempted murder in the first degree. Design or intent to affect the death of said Lisa Lee. My chance to talk to the press. Contrary to section 78204, Florida statute. I'll plead not guilty right now. And your grand jury... In the 1970s, America was gripped by a wave of terror, and at the center of it all was the sinister figure of Ted Bundy. Behind his charming facade lurked a predator like no other, a serial killer whose reign of terror spanned several states. Ted Bundy's chilling crimes, characterized by his charisma and cunning, left a trail of horror in their wake. In this video, we delve deep into the dark and disturbing world of Ted Bundy's killings. We'll explore the events that unfolded during his reign of terror, the lives he mercilessly took, and the psychological complexities that made him one of the most infamous serial killers in history. Theodore Robert Bundy, originally born as Theodore Cowell on November 24, 1946, but later known as Ted Bundy, left a haunting legacy in the annals of American crime. He was a serial killer who terrorized young women and girls during the 1970s, and his sinister deeds may have stretched back even further. After more than 10 years of denial, he eventually admitted to committing 30 murders across seven states between 1974 and 1978, although the true extent of his victims remains unknown. There is no consensus on when or where Bundy began his spree of killing women. He provided conflicting accounts to different people and remained tight-lipped about his earliest crimes, despite confessing to numerous later murders before his execution. To some, Bundy claimed he attempted his first kidnapping in 1969 in Ocean City, New Jersey, but didn't commit murder until around 1971 in Seattle. He told others that he killed two women in Atlantic City while visiting family in Philadelphia in 1969. Additionally, he hinted at murders in Seattle in 1972 and another in 1973 involving a hitchhiker near Tumwater though he refused to give details. And Rule and Detective Robert D. Keppel both believed he might have started killing as a teenager. Bundy's earliest documented homicides occurred in 1974, when he was 27. By then, he claimed to have mastered the skills to lead minimal forensic evidence at crime scenes, a time before the advent of DNA profiling. Ted Bundy came into this world at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont. His mother, Eleanor Louise Cowell, known by her middle name Louise, gave birth to him. The identity of Ted's biological father remains a mystery. His original birth certificate suggests it was a salesman and U.S. Air Force veteran named Lloyd Marshall, but another copy labels his father as unknown. Louise claimed to have had a brief encounter with a war veteran named Jack Worthington, who left her when she became pregnant. During the initial three years of his life, Bundy resided in Roxborough, Pennsylvania, a neighborhood in Philadelphia. He lived with his maternal grandparents, Samuel Connect Cowell and Eleanor Miriam Longstreet, who lovingly raised him as their own child. This arrangement was motivated by the societal norms of the time, which stigmatized births out of wedlock. To shield Ted from this stigma, family, friends, and even Ted himself were led to believe that his grandparents were his parents, while his actual mother was portrayed as his older sister. Family, friends, and even young Ted were informed that his grandparents were his parents, while his mother was portrayed as his older sister. As Bundy grew older, he eventually uncovered the truth. According to biographer and true crime writer and rule, who had a personal acquaintance with Bundy, he didn't learn the truth until 1969 when he tracked down his original birth record in Vermont. Bundy harbored a deep-seated resentment toward his mother for never revealing the identity of his real father and for leaving him to discover the truth on his own. 
During his early years, Bundy occasionally displayed troubling behavior. For instance, Louise's younger sister, Julia Cowell, once woke up from a nap to a rather unsettling scene. She found herself surrounded by knives from the kitchen, with her three-year-old nephew standing by the bed, wearing a smile on his face. In 1951, Louise attended an adult singles night at Tacoma's First Methodist Church, where she met Johnny Culpepper Bundy, a hospital cook. They tied the knot later that year, and Johnny formally adopted Ted. The couple went on to have four children together. Despite Johnny's efforts to involve his adopted son in family activities such as camping trips, Bundy remained emotionally distant. He once expressed to a girlfriend that Johnny was not his real father, perceived him as lacking intelligence, and believed he didn't earn much money. Bundy's recollections of his time in Tacoma displayed inconsistencies as time went on. To some, like Michaud and Ainsworth, he described scavenging through his neighborhood for explicit images discarded in trash barrels. In conversations with attorney and author Polly Nelson, he revealed an interest in detective magazines and crime novels, particularly those featuring stories involving sexual violence, especially if they included images of injured or deceased women. Furthermore, Bundy admitted to Michaud that he would consume significant amounts of alcohol and engage in late-night wandering, peering into windows to observe women undressing or any other activities he could catch sight of. Bundy began fantasizing about the women he saw while peeping through windows or elsewhere. During his childhood in Tacoma, Bundy's neighbor, Sandy Holt, characterized him as a bully with a penchant for inflicting fear and pain. According to Holt, he enjoyed intimidating people and asserting control over them. Additionally, Bundy was alleged to have taken younger children from the neighborhood into the woods, where he would terrorize them. He reportedly stripped them of their clothing, causing them to scream in distress, which could be heard throughout the neighborhood. After graduating high school in 1965, Bundy attended the University of Puget Sound for a year before transferring to the University of Washington to study Chinese. In 1967, he began a romantic relationship with a fellow UW student, Diane Edwards, whom he considered the love of his life. In early 1968, Bundy quit college and took on low-paying jobs. He even volunteered at the Seattle office for Nelson Rockefeller's run for president. He worked as a driver and bodyguard for Arthur Fletcher's campaign for lieutenant governor of Washington state. Edwards finished college in the spring of 68 and moved to San Francisco. Bundy came to visit her that same year after earning a scholarship to study Chinese at Stanford University over the summer. In August 1968, Bundy went to the 1968 Republican National Convention in Miami as a delegate for Rockefeller. Shortly after, Edwards ended their relationship due to Bundy's immaturity and lack of ambition. This event was considered crucial in his development by psychiatrist Dorothy Otnell Lewis. Devastated by the breakup, Bundy traveled to Colorado and then to relatives in Arkansas and Philadelphia. He also briefly attended Temple University. Around early 1969, Bundy visited the birth records office in Burlington and confirmed his true parentage, according to an rules account. In the fall of 1969, Bundy returned to Washington, where he met Elizabeth Klopfer, also known as Meg Anders, Beth Archer, or Liz Kendall. She was a single mother from Ogden, Utah, working as a secretary at the UW School of Medicine. Their relationship was turbulent and would continue even after Bundy's initial incarceration in Utah in 1976. Bundy took on a fatherly role for Klopfer's daughter, Molly, who was just three years old when he started dating her mother. He remained in Molly's life until she was ten, even after his arrest. In her adult accounts, Molly described incidents, starting at age seven, in which Bundy was abusive or sexually inappropriate with her. These accounts included physical violence, endangering her safety, indecent exposure, and sexual advances disguised as accidents or games. In the mid-1970s, 
Bundy returned to the University of Washington as a psychology major and excelled academically. He also worked at the Seattle Suicide Hotline Crisis Center in 1971, where he met and rule, a former police officer and aspiring writer. After graduating in 1972, Bundy joined Governor Daniel J. Evans's re-election campaign, shadowing Evans' opponent and eventually working for the Republican Party. Despite average LSAT scores, he gained admission to law schools at UPS and the University of Utah in early 1973 thanks to strong recommendations. During a trip to California for Republican Party business in the summer of 1973, Bundy reignited his relationship with Edwards. She was impressed by his transformation into a serious and dedicated professional, seemingly on the verge of a promising legal and political career. Notably, Bundy continued to seek Klopfer during this time, with neither woman aware of the other's existence. In the fall of 1973, Bundy started his studies at UPS Law School and simultaneously pursued Edwards, who traveled to Seattle multiple times to be with him. They even discussed marriage, and Bundy introduced Edwards to Davis as his fiancée. However, in January 1974, Bundy abruptly cut off all contact with Edwards. She was left bewildered, with her calls and letters unanswered. When she finally confronted him over the phone a month later, his response was chillingly composed, Diane, I have no idea what you mean, and he hung up. She never heard from him again. Bundy later claimed he wanted to prove to himself that he could have married her, but Edwards concluded that his intense courtship had been a calculated plan, waiting for years to make her fall in love with him, only to reject her as she had once rejected him. By then, Bundy had begun to skip law school classes, and by April, he had stopped attending altogether, coinciding with the disappearance of young women in the Pacific Northwest. Shortly after midnight on January 4, 1974, at around the time he ended his relationship with Edwards, Ted Bundy entered the basement apartment of an 18-year-old dancer and student, Karen Sparks, sometimes referred to as Joni Lenz, Mary Adams, or Terry Caldwell in different sources. He brutally attacked Sparks with a metal rod from her bed frame and sexually assaulted her using the same rod. This horrendous assault caused severe internal injuries, including a ruptured bladder, and left Sparks unconscious for 10 days. Although she survived, she suffered permanent brain damage, resulting in significant vision and hearing loss. In the early morning hours of February 1, 1974, Bundy broke into the basement room of 21-year-old Linda and Healy, a University of Washington undergraduate who reported morning radio weather updates for skiers. He assaulted Healy, rendering her unconscious, and then dressed her in jeans, a white blouse, and boots. Bundy carried her away and drove her to an isolated access road at the base of Taylor Mountain, where he murdered her and left her in the nearby woods. When questioned about how Healy may have died, Bundy responded with, My initial reaction is that I don't think I can. In the first half of 1974, there was a concerning pattern of female college students going missing, with approximately one disappearance per month. On March 12, Donna Gale Manson, a 19-year-old student at Evergreen State College in Olympia, vanished while on her way to a jazz concert on campus. Bundy described her death as horrific, claiming he had burnt her skull in his girlfriend's fireplace and vacuumed up the ashes. On April 17, 18-year-old Susan Elaine Rancourt disappeared at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg, about 110 miles southeast of Seattle. Two other female students at Central Washington later reported encounters with a man in a sling who had asked for help carrying books to his brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle, one of these encounters occurring on the night of Rancourt's disappearance. On May 6, Roberta Kathleen Parks, 22, left her dormitory at Oregon State University in Corvallis, located about 260 miles south of Seattle, with the intention of meeting friends for coffee at the Memorial Union, but never made it there. According to Bundy, he noticed Parks sitting alone in a cafeteria, struck up a conversation with her, and persuaded her to accompany him into Corvallis. 
Once in his car, he drove to an isolated area where he sexually assaulted her. Several hours later, he repeated the assault before ending her life. Meanwhile, investigators in Seattle and King County were growing increasingly concerned as there was a lack of substantial physical evidence, and the missing women had little in common other than their appearance, young, attractive, white college students with long hair parted in the middle. Then, on June 1, Brenda Carol Ball, 22, disappeared after leaving the Flame Tavern in Burien, near Seattle, Tacoma International Airport. She was last seen in the parking lot, conversing with a man with brown hair and his arm in a sling. According to Bundy's confession, he took Ball to his residence, where they had a consensual sexual encounter, before he strangled her while she slept. In the early hours of June 11, 18-year-old UW student George Ann Hawkins vanished while walking down a brightly lit alley between her boyfriend's dormitory residence and her sorority house. The next morning, three Seattle homicide detectives and a criminalist combed the entire alleyway on their hands and knees, finding nothing. Bundy later told Keppel that he lured Hawkins to his car and knocked her unconscious with a crowbar. After handcuffing her, he drove her to Issaquah, a suburb 20 miles, 30 kilometers, east of Seattle, where he strangled her and spent the entire night with her body. He later returned to the UW alley the morning after and, in the very midst of a major crime scene investigation, located and gathered Hawkins's earrings and one of her shoes where he had left them in the adjoining parking lot, and departed, unobserved. It was a feat so brazen, wrote Keppel, that it astonishes police even today. Bundy said he revisited Hawkins' corpse on three occasions. After the disappearance of Hawkins became widely known, witnesses came forward, revealing that they had seen an individual in an alley behind a nearby dormitory on the night she vanished. This person was notably on crutches, sporting a leg cast, and seemed to be struggling with a briefcase. One woman specifically remembered being approached by this individual, who asked for assistance in carrying the briefcase to his car, a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. Around this time, Bundy was employed in Olympia as the assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission. In this role, he authored a pamphlet focused on rape prevention for women. Later, he secured a position at the Department of Emergency Services, DES, a state government agency that was actively involved in the search efforts for the missing women. It was during his time at DES that Bundy crossed paths with Carol and Boone, April 12, 1947 to January 13, 2018, a woman who had been divorced twice and was a mother of two. Boone would go on to play a significant role in Bundy's life in the years to come. Reports of the brutal attack on Sparks and the unexplained disappearances of the six women made headlines in newspapers and on television across Washington and Oregon. This triggered widespread fear, leading to a sharp decline in young women hitchhiking. Law enforcement agencies faced mounting pressure, yet their efforts were severely hindered by the lack of substantial physical evidence. Police refrained from disclosing minimal available information to the press to prevent jeopardizing the ongoing investigation. Moreover, investigators observed more commonalities among the victims. The abductions consistently occurred during the night, often near areas of ongoing construction work, and usually within a week of midterm or final exams. Notably, all the victims were dressed in slacks or blue jeans when they vanished. Many crime scenes featured sightings of an individual with a cast or sling seen driving a brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. The Oregon and Washington murders reached a climax on July 14 when two women were abducted from a crowded beach at Lake Sammamish State Park. Witnesses described an attractive man named Ted, dressed in a white tennis outfit with a sling on his arm. He asked for help with a sailboat that wasn't real, luring his victims to his tan or bronze-colored Volkswagen Beetle. Some refused, one left when she realized the deception. But sadly, Janice and Ott, a 23-year-old probation caseworker, left with him. About four hours later, 
Denise Marie Nasland, a 19-year-old woman, left a picnic to go to the restroom and never returned. Bundy told that Ott was still alive when he returned with Nasland and that he forced one to watch as he murdered the other after he took them both to an isolated logging road, where he strangled them before engaging in necrophilia with and decapitating their corpses. King County Police, armed with a suspect description and his car details, distributed flyers and broadcasted a composite sketch in the Seattle area. Klopfer, Rule, a DES employee, and a UW psychology professor all identified Bundy as a potential suspect. However, detectives, overwhelmed with tips, doubted that a clean-cut law student with no adult criminal record could be the culprit. On September 6, two grouse hunters stumbled across the skeletal remains of Ott and Nasland near a service road in Issaquah, two miles east of Lake Sammamish State Park. An extra femur and several vertebrae found at the site were later identified by Bundy as those of Hawkins. Six months later, forestry students discovered the skulls and mandibles of Healy, Rancourt, Parks, and Ball on Taylor Mountain, where Bundy frequently hiked, just east of Issaquah. Manson's remains were never recovered. The absence of clothing and jewelry recovered led investigators to believe that the bodies were left and discarded at the scene naked. I hope you enjoyed part one of this video where we delved into the intriguing story. There's so much more to uncover, and I can't wait to share it with you in part two. Be sure to stay tuned for our next episode, where we'll continue this incredible journey. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell and be the first to know when part two drops.